thanks everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. You loved our next guest on The Office. I'm dying up here in Carol, Diane, and now you can see Jake Lacey in the new rom-com Ode to Joy, where Martin Freeman plays a man who literally cannot handle joy. Let's take a look. I guess she just wanted a chance to say all the things she didn't say to you. It's actually kind of a word flood. Do you want to hear? No, not really. Yeah, I don't blame you. Leave it in the past. We uh, actually ended up hitting it off. Yeah? Yeah, she's a big laugher. I don't think I'm that funny, but... Come on, you're funny. I like your De Niro. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Cape Fear. Do a line. I made him an offer he couldn't refuse. That's friend, though. Well, it's eventually him, right? Him before, yeah, I guess. Kind of. Yeah. Do like uh, Goodfellas. Look who's talking to. Jesus Christ. No, I know that one's not right. Were you talking to me? That's honestly awful. Anyway, I thought, uh, I don't know. I might ask her out. Francesca? Yeah, you know, if you're cool with it. Yeah, I'm cool with it, yeah. Good, because I don't want to, you know. No, of course, sure. Be my guest. You two are perfect together. You sure? Yeah, I've said I'm sure. Right. Everybody, please welcome Jake Lacey. Hey. Hello. How are you? Good to see you. How are you? I'm all right. I'm chewing gum. You want to spend keeping it cash? No, no. Oh, okay. That's all right. You want to do announce that you're keeping it cash? I just want people to know that I'm aware. <laughs> and I've got gum. It's a little rude, but I didn't want to have bad breath. Right. I'm, I'm being rude, but I'm not. I know I'm being rude, guys. I'm aware. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. I'm cutting yeah. in line. I know. Uh, congrats on the film. I loved it. Thank I thought you. you were great in it. I feel like this is a part that we've never really seen you play, which is the sort of lovable, fun uh, sidekick. In a way. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, lovely to be a sidekick to Martin Freeman. You're gen I mean, you're not always a serious character per se, but even in I'm Dying Up Here, I would say that you were the more serious of the comedians. And within this, I mean, you are there to sort of be uh, the comedic, uh, the light touch in a lot of these scenes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that new for, <laughs> is that new for you? I mean, um, the first job I ever had was a multicam called Better With You, and and was like a probably dimmer version of uh, who I play in this. So I... Um, what was better better than you? Better With You. Better With You. Yes. Who was that with? That was, uh, it was uh, Jennifer Finnegan and Joanna Garcia Swisher, now, um, were sisters, and they were in these like long, they were in these relationships, and I was Joanna's new boyfriend and then like immediate fiance and then she got pregnant and it it, it was like um you followed like our relationship and jennifer and, and josh cook and then um the parents um would this have Deborah been like a, a how long did the, the oh man like a year oh really year. yeah it was on abc um yeah and that was it, your first gig yeah and it was an interesting like uh just real deep dive like technical TV stuff. It was an interesting experience to, to like, uh, it was my first real job, like job, job ever really with, with acting. And um, we got picked up when there was like one network head. And then in the interim between like us getting picked up and the show going to air, there was a new network head. And so it was like an interest, you know, to, to like not get any press as like the shows on either side of you are being promoted on the channel and you're like why aren't we getting any what happened here you weren't you weren't that network head because we weren't a hit and we weren't chosen by like the new guy and as much as everybody says like that's not true you're like if you were a hit they would definitely like keep you around but if not it's like the new people want to come in and say like clean slate this is the stuff that we chose and this is how we define the network and like the last person was here and this is what they chose and Thanks for playing, <laughs> you know? Of everything that isn't working that that person created, so I can create as much new stuff as, as I want. Yeah, yeah. So, like, we were in between the middle, which was already, like, had legs, and Modern Family, which was, like, this immediate juggernaut, and then we were kind of, like, slotted into the middle. That said, um, still a pilot into a year as your first... Like, how, how old were you at that point? Oh, man, I was, like, 24. It, it's, the, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Like, yeah. it got me... That's the last time I, like, paid bills not from acting you know and then that money floated me for like a year and a half of, of not booking things and and really allowed me like get my foot in the door for pilot season and then that you know like 
Yeah, that was it was huge to like. The next thing, the office after that. Yeah, I shot a couple pilots, and then got replaced. I uh, there was a show called The Goodwin Games that ran for like six episodes on Fox. You got replaced. <clears throat> yeah, so I shot the pilot. Really wanted to do it. it was Becky Newton and Scott Foley and the guys from um, How I Met Your Mother. And then, again, like a network kind of like situation. And they replaced me with T.J. Miller. And I thought, like, I'm never going to work again. Like, that's it, you know? Um, and in that, you know, show, I would have been playing, like, a, a, another sort of, like, a uh, little bit of a dope, but, like, a well-meaning dope. And, uh, and I thought, like, I'm never, this is it. This is the end of the road for Jake. And then at the end of the summer, my manager called and was like, they're going to add two guys to the office and they're your age, and uh, you got a shot, you know? And uh, and then, like, the second best thing that ever happened was, like, getting to be on The Office for a year and be on my favorite show. And What was um, it like, though, when you... How did they tell you that you were getting replaced? You know, there's some real, like, terrible ways that people find out. This was that, Twitter like, or... <laughs> Twitter, yeah. <the> trades. <laughs> yes, showing up for your first day and being like, these clothes don't fit. Who's this guy? <laughs> Hi, TJ. Oh, great to meet you. Um, no, the creator's called, which is like, I wouldn't say, I don't know if it's rare, but like, it meant the world to me, and it shows like the character of who those guys are, yeah. that they could have outsourced that to casting, to call my manager, to call me, you know what I mean, like to dilute the pain somehow through a series of assistants calling other people to call their assistant to call me, and instead like they all got on the phone and called me directly and said like, here's what's going on, which you can't really ask for anything more than someone being like, this sucks and we liked working with you and I'm sorry. You're like, wow, okay. <laughs> it's also hard when you're counting on that money. <laughs> it's yeah, of course. hard when you're like, I'm set up for the year. Okay, I, I got my money now for the year. And then you go, oh, that's gone and somehow I'm gonna make the money from this pilot last until, you know. Any commercials out there I can audition for kind of thing? Yeah, 100%, yeah. yeah. Or being like, are they gonna replace other people on other shows? Can I audition for that? Can I be the T.J. Miller of my version for this other? You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. So, but you know, it's like you just assume that that thing means you're done, and like the darkness is upon you. And then on the other side, maybe there's something good. What yeah. kind of when you were coming out of acting school? What kind of actor did you perceive yourself as? Like, what kind of characters did you see you most likely playing? When I went to drama school, I was um, often cast as like a masculine lead. Jawline. Mostly based off my chin, yes. <laughs> um, um, and I think I thought I would, you know, be doing like Shakespeare regionally. Um, the movies I loved were like Ghostbusters and Goodfellas and wanted to be either like Bill Murray or Ray Liotta. Um, and thought I had a shot at that. Really wanted to be Daniel Day-Lewis, like all of us, or Marlon Brando, but you go like, well, I'm probably not a once in a generation talent. So <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll lower that bar a little bit. I mean, they don't even know. I mean, maybe Brando did or felt that way. But Daniel Day-Lewis, like, he has no idea what it means to be a once-in-a-generation talent. He's just No, no one does. None of them thing. do, yes. I think Brando yes. did, and that's, what, that's unfortunately what happened to him. <laughs> Man, I mean, did you see the Listen to Me, Marlon? Did you see that with the digitized head? No. That stuff? So, for anyone who cares, there's a documentary called um, Listen to Me, Marlon. In the 80s, Marlon Brando was not far off but was convinced that eventually studios would own your likeness and they would just pay you for the use of your trademarked likeness and then they'd have you play any role and they could fill it. So he had himself like scanned and it's this weird like pre-DOS like, <laughs> like, you know, floating digitized head and at the same time was doing all these recordings for no one but of like his thoughts on life, his thoughts on his life, on acting. On and this filmmaker paired the two of those things up and so used his digitized head along this like floating head along with his own words and his um like disregard for his own genius and awareness of his own genius and like yeah it was like a double-edged sword that he the way that he viewed himself in a way yeah I mean, those later movies where he apparently always had an earpiece 
yes. was writing was writing the dialogue on his hand, which just yes. refused to read lines or memorize his lines simply because one, he thought he was a genius, but also two thought the whole thing was stupid. Yeah. A mix like within the documentary, there's both footage that like makes me get a little like misty eyed where he talks about like, you can look it up on YouTube. It's like Marlon Brando on acting and it's clips from his films. And he's like, you got to stop the movement of the popcorn to the mouth. Mm. Like you got to get them you got to deliver a line the way that no one would deliver a line. You got like it's so beautiful what he's saying and he goes, "Damn, damn, damn, when it's right, it's right." And then you feel good and you feel it in your bones and then you feel whole. And you're like, "Woo." Like on my best day, I relate to that want. And at the same time, you know, 20 minutes later in the documentary, he's like, "It's all just bullshit. This whole thing is bullshit." And you're like, "Woo." Like his disdain and love for this thing all at once is kind of wild. I think also that part of that like earpiece thing is that he figured he like made it to the other side of <laughs> this whole thing where he was like, let's stop with the construct of dialogue and places and marks and all this stuff, much to the chagrin of people that worked with him. <laughs> but he figured out how to like get to the other side where these thoughts are just arriving in your head and then you're saying them but you'd have to be a genius to pull it off. You know what I mean? Like, I couldn't go on set and do that, I don't think. Not, and give a performance anywhere near what he gives, you know? There's also got to be a sense of that for all actors, whether genius or not, though, that delivering a line in a special way and the feeling that that creates within you versus the feeling of you felt like you didn't, you were working on something that wasn't great and it turns out to be something wildly successful or you're working on something where you got that feeling and it turns out you see it in the theater and it's actually quite bad. Yeah, I've had both. Yeah, I've had both. Like know? every actor's, that's why I think when you hear about older actors just kind of showing up I mean, like, you don't have to do that much work. Just do the thing. You sort of get it because they've had probably so many experiences where they were like, I'm going to pour my life into this role. And then they went and saw it, and it was, you know. Or that maybe, you know, I'm only 10 years into this, but my belief would be that they figure out that there's a lot of work to be done at home. Right. And then when you show up and you're dealing with another person, that that's got to go away. Because you can't, like be doing your homework in class. <laughs> you can't like show up and be like, I'll create this character while doing a scene. It's like, you have to like, I heard a story about um, Christian Bale um, with McKay and, and he was, you know, doing like Dick Cheney and like two weeks into filming, like came to McKay and was like, I figured out the walk. He was like, watch this and like walked across the set with like the slumped like weight of a thing. He was like, McKay was like, yeah, that's it. He'd been doing a great version of it for two weeks and then somehow found this thing that was like, oh, that's it. And then for the rest of the movie had this like slouched, like lumbering thing, go, you know, like I just think guys figure out that you show up and like there's these discoveries that happen there as well, but to be too precious about them probably kills them. So I do think at least in my experience, I've like way over prepared and way under prepared and both leave me disappointed. <laughs> so like <laughs> learning to do the right preparation maybe and then coming in and hoping that it flies is the hope, the way to go. Well, learning, I think for most actors, it's learning what makes, what satisfies you, not relying on your homework to make you shine more in the movie or anything like that. It's what satisfies you on the day. And, and to protect, like, what you know the boundaries to be, right? To be, like, because sometimes you have input from a director, another person, a, a, a set of circumstances that you're shooting. You know, like, we can't possibly, you know, like, little stuff where you're like, I don't want to be facing this person during this scene. I want to only be able to look once and then look back. And being like, we can't shoot it that way because we're not on a set. We're in a house, so we're going to have to shoot this way and this way, and you're going to have to find a way to do it. So then, like... Now you've got to maneuver to find a way to tell this story that you wanted to tell your way and work within the new parameters, not the thing that, like, you're sitting in your living room being like, and then they'll say this, and then I'll look back. It's like, that's all gone, you know? Right. But as long as you have, like, the integrity of what you want to communicate, then you can kind of shift and sculpt along with another person saying, that's to this, or, like, uh, that's not the right... 
I don't want you to come in hot like that. You can't like start there. We gotta like have a place to go or I wanna see you be more put out by this as opposed to being passive about it. Or you know, like whatever it is, but to be able to take that in and then hopefully keep the integrity of the thing that you think needs to happen and how did yeah. you how did you find drama? Like how did you find acting? As a kid? Yeah. You're from Mass. We've talked about this. You're from Massachusetts, right? Born in Mass. Right. Grew up in Vermont. Small town. We're from very similar areas. Yeah. Yeah. And in my area, like the drama club, was not cool. I was in it. Yeah. But we were not cool. No. I, it was a. Uh, I mean, like. I thought we were cool, but other people did not think we were cool. <laughs> right. Yeah. We. I was very fortunate that my elementary school, and then high school had, arts funding, had like a drama club. Huge. Which I think like doesn't exist in a lot of places anymore. It was new for us. We had just gotten it the right. the years that I started in, in high school. It's wild. Yeah. It's wild to think it was an option and now it's just not an option. You know what I mean? To be like, you'll never get to discover this unless you're eighteen and you go think you want to do this somewhere else. But like I loved movies as a kid obsessively. As a, just a viewer, not to be like, how do they do this? But being like just watching movies on repeat. And um and really wanted attention as a kid. Wanted a lot of like accolades and attention. And so like being on stage and people liking me was a- You an only child? No, I have a younger brother. Um, nope, just really desperate, just really <laughs> desperate. Um, and uh, so that helped, right? And then I also played sports and was like an athlete and uh, kind of party animal and in Boy Scouts. And, you know, just like did a lot of stuff. Um, but then when I was in high school, I went to a vocational school. I tried to drop out of high school and my parents thankfully didn't let that happen. And there was a vocational school that m focused on like diesel mechanics and cooking and stuff where you could like enter the workforce straight out of high school, right? You could do like two years there and then have a job for kids that maybe weren't financially able to go to school or didn't have an interest in it to go to, to pursue college. And there was an acting program in this rural little vocational school set up by a guy who had like grown up there, went to North Carolina School of the Arts, then lived in New York for a decade as an actor, and then went back home and became a teacher. And I was lucky enough to get into that, which was just like, again, a continuation of like public funding for the arts. And um, and they set me up, and then I went to North Carolina School of the Arts. And, and that was really where I went from being like, I like the, the attention that I get up here to being like, Oh, this is a, a craft. Like, there's a thing to work here that is creatively hugely fulfilling. To, like, imagine something and then build it with other people is, like, there's, for me, nothing better. <laughs> like, it's all I want, you know? And then went to school and, and um, was lucky enough to, like, do well enough there or be treated well enough there by the teachers to not get... The boot, and um, and there then ever a moment York. where you were worried you were going to get the boot? I at the end of my first year there, um, you know, shout out to drugs and alcohol. <laughs> um, like, didn't go to class for three weeks and just stayed in my um, college dorm apartment, like doing drugs. I had friends coming to the house to be like, you gotta go to class. Like, this is a conservatory. There's nothing else here but these classes. It's not like you kind of didn't show up. It's like there's 20 kids in a class and you're just like staying home and getting high. And then I got a letter from the school that was like, um, this might not be for you. Like, if you can't pull your shit together, this place might not be for you. So they put me on what they call arts probation, which is, <laughs> at the time, you're like, arts probation. <laughs> but really is them being like, get it together. Right. And... Um, so I got it together and then stayed through. But I think they could have said, like, enough is enough. You got to go. Um, but they very kindly kept me around. And in those days, in those days, I'm 33, not like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was in school, um, they often, like, because there was more interest and more funding, again, uh, they would, like, it was a bloodbath after second year. You'd start with like 35 kids and they'd cut it in half. Half of those kids just weren't invited back. Not because of behavioral stuff, they'd just be like, I'm not sure you've got it. <laughs> Gone. <Wow. clears throat> so you could dedicate yourself to, your family could also dedicate finances to two years of an acting program, which they're probably already leery about doing. And then you'd be like, I got kicked out. You're like, did you do something wrong? And they're like, I just wasn't good enough. <laughs> 
Like, it's so, so insane. It's also probably over decades a kindness to those kids to be like, you should pursue this elsewhere because maybe this isn't the program for you. Or you should find another way to be a part of this world. Like, we're not saying you can't. There's a, there's a million jobs in this industry. Like, it just might not be acting. Um, but that had w waned a little bit when I was there, so it wasn't quite as brutal. And uh, or you were good. I don't mean that I would. I was like on the chopping block as much as being like the cultural, the like social cultural stress of being twenty and thinking like half of us will be gone next year was a little eased. You know, like people chose to leave maybe, but not like I got the boot. So you guys never. Um, so then I graduated and I moved here and kicked around for a couple of years, not knowing how to be like proactive and show up for myself. And um, what does that mean for you? I got I had a lot of meetings like out of school. We do a showcase. We come here and do a showcase, and um, had a lot of meetings with agents and casting people, and was either out of my own sense of self or lack of sense of self or lack of business acumen or just the way I was raised to not annoy people directly, I thought that like calling them back after meeting was, I'd be a pest. Yeah. That it would be like, if they want to work with me, they will call me. <laughs> I'm not going to call and be like, we had a meeting, do you want to, would you ever want to be meeting with me? Like, just thought that was gross and annoying and needy and didn't understand that that's actually like proactive and showing up for yourself. And if I was going to hire someone, and met with 10 people and one of them called to say, hey, I really enjoyed meeting you. I'd love to work together. I'd be like, that's the guy. It's a go-getter. Let's let's bring that guy along, you know? I feel like it's a very, I don't know, it feels like a very New England thing to not want to be a go-getter. To be like- <laughs> Oh, to not want to be a go-getter. To be like, go-getters are annoying. Uh -huh. I don't want to be that annoying go-getter guy. Like, there, because I, I yes. very much relate to that feeling of like, I'm not going to call them. Oh, God, right. that sounds- that sounds so horrible. It feels like this weird sense of like lack of gratitude. Yeah. To be like, isn't the thing you have enough? Just be happy with what you've got. Yeah. Why exactly. are you being so fancy about this? Yeah. Why do you have to, including like, I love um, design and style and menswear and all this stuff. And like, when I grew up, where I grew up, you know, taking the time to like look cool or not wear sort of general, like, Carhartt mall attire was like, who's this guy? Yep. What are you trying to do? What, are you better than this place? <laughs> okay, guy. Like, and I was very, I absorbed that fully, you know? I'm, like, still sort of, I've got some short pants on here today, you know? But, like, I'm still kind of trying to find my way through that mentality of, of like, don't shoot too high. Don't reach for too much. Don't take things that aren't yours. Don't like, don't admit that you want big, nice things. You know, like you can secretly, quietly want big, nice things, but don't tell people about it. Right. Don't go after it. Like just lay low, man. Just take the thing you've got and make the best of it and move on. So I had that mentality when I moved here to being like, just live here, okay? It's just a hard mentality someone will to call. Shake. Very. Yeah. Including, I've been very fortunate to like work as an actor. And even within that, have that mentality a bit of being like, I desperately want this thing. And I also don't want to let anyone know that I desperately want this thing. You know, that there's like a vulnerability in being like, I really want that. Um, yeah. Man, we're digging in deep. <laughs> Boy, everybody's getting a real treat into the world of Jake today. Oh, do yeah. you think that um, we'll jump ahead a little bit? Do you sure. think that I'm to dying the healthy up me? To, yeah, to the <laughs> healthy me, playing an unhealthy character. Sure. Uh, do you think that I'm dying up here was your most challenging role that you've had to take on? It's the one that I've seen you. I feel like have to do something completely different. Like this is different, but it's fun and it's a bit light. I'm dying up here. I had never seen you play a character like that. And same with Diane as well. Thank you very much for mentioning those projects. Um, they mean a lot to me. Diana was a very beautiful movie. I Thanks. Thinking. Thank you. The I have like two dif two answers in the version of difficulty. Like those films were 
for those who've not seen either of them, I uh, play a heroin addict in both of these projects. One living in, um, we shot it in Kingston, New York mainly, but essentially Western Massachusetts. Um, and the other is a, playing a stand-up comic in the 1970s in Los Angeles who also is dealing with drug addiction and um, the effects of incest and uh, stuff like that and trying to be an entertainer at the same time. And uh, both of those projects were not difficult <laughs> be, uh, in in a way that maybe like, like I relate to the pain that those people experience. And so it was a gift to be able to offer that. A gift to like read a story and be like, I know what that feels like. I know what that is. I know where that comes from. I know what the hope is that you can't get to. I know what the pain is that you don't want to be a part of. I know what it is to escape. I know, you know, like to relate to those things and then to also be working with people on both those projects who are collaborative and thoughtful and wanted to hear my thoughts on the story and the character and saying like, I'd really appreciate it if we could do this, but pivot it a little bit that way because I feel like that's the, that's the way into the thing and like, and being heard in that way that's the part that makes it not difficult, is when you go like, I think I have a beat on this thing, and you're hearing me. Mm -hmm. Wow, like that that part, feel that's like the difficulty's gone, because then you can like show up and do your thing, and if people respond to it, they do, and if they don't, they don't, but at least you know that like you've gotten to offer what you wanted to offer, or what you have to offer, that somebody else might not. Or the difficulty is when you have a take on a role, and the people behind the camera don't necessarily want to hear that take or want to shoot something completely different or against even what your take is. Yeah, when you're when you're trying to be collaborative, you're trying to be thoughtful and listen to a, a writer or a director or a co-star or a thing, whatever it is, and you're like, this is not right. Yeah. This is not right. Like, that's not the way this... Okay, how do you want to shoot it? How do you want to do it? <laughs> okay. And that's where, like, the professional part of this job comes in is not just to, like, show up and feel things and communicate that with other people, but to be like, this is also a job, and I have a skill set, and I've been paid to come here and, like, make this work. So how do I make this work? How do I massage this into a place where, like, I feel like we're doing the thing that we should be doing, and it's a good joke or bit or scene or relationship, whatever it is, you know? And at the same time, people are getting the product that they've paid you to give them because at the end of the day, they're like, we hired you to do this job and we send you a check, and for that check, you provide these services. Right. You know, like... Are you good at hiding uh, these days, the moment where you go, oh, let's do it, where, where are we shooting this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, it's twofold, it's twofold. Of course. One is like, I'm... Acting that, look, people, acting gets a better up. Acting is fucking hard, in my opinion, especially those moments where you have that thing in your stomach that is telling you that this thing that you have to do is going to be wrong, but you have to do it anyway. Right. It's really hard to not exhale an exasperated... <laughs> Especially when, for me, I'm like stubborn and opinionated and obsessive. I internally, right? And so to, to release that as best you can or to... I guess what I'm getting better at is protecting what I'd like to do and saying, okay... If you'd like something different than what, I, what I'd what i like, here's my boundaries on this. I don't want it to be this, and I don't want it to be that. So, like, within this spectrum, can you talk to me about the other options that you'd prefer, and then I'll feel comfortable and you'll feel comfortable. Whereas before, I'd be, like, huffy and then throw in the towel. You know what I mean? Where I'd be like, that's not the... How do you want me to do it? What do you want? How do you want to do this? They'd be like, like the, the with the thing. You're like, okay, then I'll do that. And we'd shoot it, and I'd do it their way, and then we'd be done. You know, which sucks for them, and sucks for me, and sucks for probably a terrible product. You know what I mean? It's like, I never was like stormy on set, but you'd be like, well, Jake didn't like doing that scene. <laughs> you know? Of course, there's a, like it's the rare person who's stormy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, who's really like. But there is that thing of like, like I've seen it before. Like when I when I when I've made things where someone's like. <sighs> <laughs> and then the director's like, do I ask him if anything's okay? If everything's okay? Or do we just keep going? What do we do here? How do we handle this? I think the other part is like understanding better, starting to get to uh, like, doing my best to not discredit myself. 
um, as just like an entitled actor. Right. But like I'm slowly getting to this place where I'm getting to work enough that I'm not picking and choosing based on like getting offers or something, but just saying like I don't think I want to audition for that because I don't think it's a thing I want to do and I think it's going to end up being negative for them and for me. Well, like, the entitlement... I can't offer the thing they want. The entitlement that comes with acting, right, is not necessarily... Entitlement is not the right word. It's this idea that you you have no control on right. set. And so you have... The, what you have control over is this minor thing that you've done homework on, that you've prepared. And if you show up to set and no one gives a flying fuck about that, right. that's pretty damaging. And suddenly you look entitled because everybody else has been doing a very clear craft for five hours waiting for you to get there or something. Yes. And they're waiting for you to go. And suddenly they, you are responding to something that they haven't seen or haven't heard a conversation about. And so they're just watching you as this actor who's just shown up and relieved your stand-in go... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Kidding me. Right. You're like, this guy's been in his air conditioned trailer for three hours. We're out here in the sun. And now he doesn't want to tell the joke they wrote <laughs> for more money than the rest of Like, the fuck out of here. You know what I mean? And there's a part of me that feels that way about myself at times where I'm like, just tell it, just say the line, just do it. Yeah. But I think the other part of that is like, then don't take that job, Jake, right. or whoever's uppity about, the, about having to like, I can't believe they want me to do the thing they're paying me to do. <laughs> Assholes. You're like, well, then don't take that gig, man. Like, if you can't show up and offer the thing, it's like if you worked in food service and someone paid you to cater a party and you were like, I only do entrees. And they're like, well, we want, like, to pass appetizers. You're like, I don't do that. I'll pass entrees. You're like, then you shouldn't have taken this gig for small plates. Like, what are you doing? During appetizers, I sit in the back. I sit Come in my up. air conditioned trailer yeah. and wait Come for the up dessert. For yeah, so I think that's the other part is me getting a little better at um, knowing what I'm getting into and just financially being like lucky to have had some jobs that I was really happy to take that paid me enough to sustain through times where like I get an, uh, uh, an audition or an offer that like potentially would pay money that I'd like to have, but I'm okay enough to say like, I'm going to be able to pay rent, and I don't need to take that job just because I'm greedy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be okay right now, and I can hopefully wait it out until there's another job that coincides with money and fulfillment. And if there's not, then I'll take a job that is just money, and I'll smile and be happy that I'm getting paid. You know, like... Can I ask, what is it, without naming the name of any job that you have to joy. <laughs> oh, to joy. No. Of any, not naming the name or anything of anything, that you, but what is the type of stuff that you find that you're like, I actually don't, I don't think that's something that I want to do? Well, very early on, it was after doing um, multicam. Uh, that was like that first job. And the next pilot season, I was like, I don't want to go in for multicam. I'd like to go in for single camera because I like that style better. And I wasn't actually good at that style of work. I just appreciated it as a fan. And my management... Single cam? You, you appreciate it? Yes. You, but you weren't good at it yet? No, no. It even... Yeah, no, yeah. I was still very, like, presentational. And so the things I was probably better at booking were things that I aesthetically didn't really like, even though it's what my personal <laughs> offering was, you know? Being like, I have a skill set, and I don't want to do the work that that skill set actually makes me right for. I want to do this thing over here, but I'm not actually good at it yet. And and my agents and manager were very smart to say, like, you should go in on everything because you've done one show, and it was multicam, and so most of the people that are going to be interested in seeing you are going to be seeing that work and wanting to put you in something else like it. But let's go in for all this stuff, and then we'll take it piece by piece. You know, like, my mentality ends up being much more binary about like, I won't do this anymore, you know? And they're like, Rel relax, like, let's just go job by job and we'll look at the parts and we'll look at the pieces and see how it all comes together and then you can decide. You know, like they're much healthier about um, how to sort of continue forward. So it, in my mind, it's sort of drawing those lines and then was lucky enough, you know, like to sort of move forward through the career to be like, and then I got to do the office, right? And so, that's a single cam, and then after that, I did a small film, and then was on a show on HBO, and so then I was like, I want to stay in this world. I want to try to stay over here, right? And then sometimes your finances get really thin, because um, this gig doesn't always pay well, you know? 
And then a pilot season will come around where I'm like, let's look at network stuff. Because, right. like, because I'm broke. <laughs> you know, or, like, you get I'm married. And have a, you know, like. Then you could get, I have to go to questions, I know. But then you could get kind of screwed, though, when you jump into network stuff. Because, I mean, financially, you would be set, but you would also be signing on for seven years, which could be. Yeah, yeah. it's always, you know, that's a real really lucky nothing, problem to have, Yeah, right? nothing gets picked up for that much, for that long anymore. No, you either become, like, worth $100 million or you have a good year, you know? But, like... Um, the critics loved it. <laughs> like, right. Yeah, yeah. A cult following of a pilot. Um, um, <laughs> you get it on sling. Uh, <laughs> the, the, yeah, I mean, it's like a real first world problem, but in trying to think of this career as like a marathon and not this sprint, it's like, what's the, if I have the opportunity to, what is the career I want to build or what are the pieces I want to put together and what do I want to continue working on and with and like the I don't know maybe people don't publicly talk about it I, I think that it's like very like there's like the way it's perceived in and out of the business is like if you're in this camp stay in that camp and if you're in this camp you're not allowed in this camp there's a real like this guy does multi-cam we don't want him in this thing it's crazy to see like Jim Parsons who's brilliant on the Big Bang Theory able to make this leap because so often the industry and public perception is like, I don't want to see that guy do the other thing. I want to see the guy do the thing that I like him doing, you know? And so if, if I get this opportunity to be in a world that I want to stay in, then I'm doing everything I can to stay in that world because it feels like if you scoot out to the side, they go, ah, he doesn't do this thing anymore. It's a weird, maybe it's all my own mind, but like it feels very real that that's true. More darkness, guys. More darkness. More uh, I think we have time for uh, right here. Go ahead. Hey, man. How are you? Right on. Is there a uh, character that you've played that you relate to the most? Yeah, that character on I'm Dying of Here. I did a show for Showtime. And, uh, yeah. I mean, my story is not as dark as his story. But um, that, that character yeah his name was Nick Beverly and uh yeah when that show ended I was like devastated because I thought like I'm never gonna see that guy again you know like I'm never gonna see that character he's just gone a person that like felt like a twin is now like dust is just evaporated you know um it was like heartbreaking <laughs> It was like a very small creative like grieving process to be like, this person's gone now. Um, so I'd say that character probably the most. Uh, out of what he wanted to offer and couldn't, I'd say. Uh, one more. Hello. Hey, how's it going? How are you? Good, how are you? I'm all right. So I was wondering what what it was like working with Martin Freeman and if you, if you had any like fun stories that happened on set between you two. Sure. Uh, yeah, Ode to Joy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> joy. Um, uh, yeah, first of all, Martin, just wonderful. Shot me an email this morning. It was so sweet. Um, he, I, I'm a big fan of the UK office and tried to keep that under wraps um, as long as I could because I didn't want to, like, nerd out on a colleague, you know, and be like, it's really cool in that episode, you know. But it slowly, like, came out, and luckily he has an affinity and understanding of, like, um, fans for his work. <laughs> and if you've ever seen the UK office, he, well, he and sometimes Gervais do a thing where they go, like, wow. <laughs> like, when they've been busted a little bit or, like, when something inappropriate happens, they'd be, like, wow. And I would throw it into scenes in this <laughs> movie with Martin. And he would be like, you can't do that. You can't, like, people are going to know. You can't, you can't, in the middle of us being brothers, go, wow. <laughs> like, they're going to know. Um, yeah, so that and also he said this lovely thing where he was like, he's like, I love the acting that's like, you don't know it's happening. Like, whatever happened to Jack Lemmon? And I was like, wow, what a beautiful, not what happened to him, like, what did that work, he did it work out he's, for him? He said, he did. Um, yeah, he's gone, he's gone. Um, but more like his brand, or like Tony Curtis, like, 
this ease and grace with their performance that now we often reward like acting this really like gritty like muscular acting because we all realize like that's acting whoa you must lose or gain weight to get any traction whatsoever <laughs> yeah i mean just like there's got to be spit on the lips and like a seething like thing happening you know and he was like whatever happened to those guys and like or to that to an appreciation of that thing you know and i just thought that was so lovely that i've like sort of taken that and i don't accomplish it but i just like hold that dear to be like oh right you can there's something really beautiful about like the ease and the grace of a performance that you don't realize is happening until it sort of percolates and unfolds and you're like man I just watched Four Weddings and a Funeral, the film. Uh, so did I. I watched it like two weeks ago. It's on Netflix, right? Like they just, they must have just dropped it, yeah. Hugh Grant. Unbelievable. Phenomenal. Also, though, can we, like, and this was what I took away from watching that. Hugh Grant, beautiful. Un Beyond. Yeah, unbelievably Dude. beautiful. I, I couldn't get, I almost honestly could not get over it. it. It's like other people are in these scenes and it like ceases. <laughs> You're just like, oh, Hugh's in this scene. With, like, is there other people there? I don't know. <laughs> and he's sort of like doing the blinking and the thing and the look. But like when they're at the wedding where Duckface comes up behind him and is sort of crazy. And then the, uh, Fee comes up and is like, how's Duckface? And he's like, good, good, actually. But like him watching Andy McDowell, like just him in love with her. And then as he goes in the other room and... Fiona saying like it's you Charlie like I've always loved you his like ease in listening to her say I love you is like gorgeous like it's so hard to it's like that skill in itself to just be like present to a person and let them speak and hear them is like I'm still working on that you know and Hugh beautiful charming Hugh Grant also, shout out to Paddington too. If you guys haven't seen great Paddington. movie, great movie. It's so those Paddington movies are the best. Yeah, and he's quite a lot in Paddington too. Hardcore, yeah. hardcore. They do use the term "darkest Peru," which is a little. I'm not really comfortable with it. Wish they had changed that um, for the 21st century, but um, the films are lovely. And shout out to Hugh Grant. Um, shout out to Ode to Joy, which shout comes out to out, Ode to Joy uh, comes out tomorrow, right? In yes, theaters. Yeah, theaters, VOD. Digital, the whole deal. And uh, we didn't get into it, but you've got a bunch of projects coming up soon as well, right? There's a bunch of stuff coming up. I just out. wrapped up uh, High Fidelity. They're doing a, we're Amazing. doing a 10 episode thing for Hulu based on the book and film. And uh, Zoe Kravitz is the lead and uh, she plays Rob. It's like we've made it a female lead instead of a male lead. Still owns a record shop. It's in Brooklyn and uh, super proud of it. I can't wait to. To see it, that'll be February. That'll come out. Jake Lacey, everybody, let's hear it. Thanks, guys.